Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I'm Michael Green from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. On March 11th, um, uh, I'm sure everyone in this room watched uh, the television with uh, absolute horror uh, as the earthquake, tsunami, and then nuclear disaster hit Tohoku. Um, I lived for a time in Iwate um, and had been to the coast to many of the places that were hardest hit when the when the tsunami came through. I think for um, everyone who knew Japan uh, and many who didn't, um, it showed some of the real strengths of Japanese society. Um, people talk about Japanese youth uh, of this generation being lost and yet tens of thousands of people left their jobs and homes and went north to help with the recovery. Um, there have been um, obituaries written for the US-Japan alliance and yet through Operation Tomodachi uh, the U.S. and Japan um, engaged in unprecedented levels of um, complex operations to rescue people and save lives. <clears throat> um, the outpouring of um, private assistance from the United States, but not just the United States, around the world. Korea raised more money uh, in the month after uh, 311 uh, through the Korean Red Cross than ever before in its history. So it was just a remarkable demonstration of how much people care about Japan not only because of respect for the Japanese people and Japan's role in the world, <clears throat> but because Japan matters an awful lot to all of us. We um, at CSIS, like a lot of people in this town, wanted to do what we could to show support, to help. Um, and we understood that in the recovery and reconstruction process, the, the Japanese people, the Japanese government, industry, civil society would lead. But we thought it would be possibly helpful um, both in substance and in, and in, and in solidarity, um, to offer our ideas on what the United States could do in all sectors to stand with Japan after March 11th, um, to bring our own experiences uh, from Three Mile Island or Katrina or other uh, uh, disasters we have either managed or mismanaged uh, to help Japan think this through. And very, uh, I think, importantly, to um, recommend ways that the um, flowering of cooperation between civil society, between our militaries, between our governments and business, how we could sustain that uh, beyond the recovery period through the reconstruction and really revitalize the U.S.-Japan alliance and partnership in, the, in, in not only the weeks and months but the years ahead. Um, on April 11th, we announced a task force, the Partnership for Recovery and a Stronger Future. John Hamry, our CEO, who's in Japan right now, uh, called um, Jim McInerney, the CEO of Boeing, who very quickly uh, and enthusiastically agreed to, to help uh, by chairing the meeting and volunteering Stanley Roth to serve on the task force. Other um, uh, corporation CEOs, um, senior civil society leaders joined as well. Um, we have a longstanding uh, relationship with Keidanren, the Japanese Business Federation, and Yoni Kurasan, the chairman, also said we'd like to help. Um, he um, uh, wanted this to be an American uh, vision and an American task force, but he gave us uh, Kiyoaki Abaraki uh, to help uh, run the project and was very generous uh, in helping set up meetings for us in Tohoku and in Tokyo as we did research. So today we're ready to um, present to you uh, our findings and our recommendations. We'll have a panel in just a moment, but we are very privileged first to hear from two of the um, individuals who were uh, right at the center of this, um, uh, responding to the crisis and building uh, uh, all the connections that had to happen between the U.S. and Japan in the immediate response and in building for um, recovery and reconstruction. Um, uh, my good friend, uh, the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian Pacific Affairs, Kurt Campbell, and Japan's distinguished ambassador, Ichiro Fujisaki. Um, this was an independent task force of private citizens but uh, the uh, government of Japan and the U.S. government were very helpful in listening to our ideas and telling us what they were already planning on doing so we didn't replicate it and in, and in joining in the discussion. So we're very pleased today uh, to first invite uh, Kurt Campbell to uh, help put this in perspective from the U.S. government perspective. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, and distinguished friends, Ambassador Fujisaki, uh, all the players who were involved in this important effort. Uh, on behalf of the U.S. government and the U.S.-Japan Alliance, I want to thank you for uh, an extraordinarily important endeavor. Um, uh, government is a series of 
uh, hold your breath moments, challenges that you're not really sure how you're gonna cope with. Um, I've had my share over uh, about uh, two decades in government by an order of magnitude, the most frightening, concerning um, uh, periods of my life in government uh, were during uh, the uh, nuclear crisis, the immediate aftermath of this. And it was uh, felt by so many of us on many levels, uh, uh, personal and emotional. Uh, I, like many of the people who work in Asia, have come to love Asia. I love Japan. I love working with Japan. I love uh, the colleagues and the friendships that I've developed there. But more than anything else, I love the feel of what it feels like to walk through a, a, a quiet Japanese street or find a, a, a quiet, beautiful place and experience um, uh, the almost sublime majesty uh, of Japan. And frankly, during that period, during the uh, days and hours after the initial crisis, we were uncertain about uh, the, that very future. Uh, and, and I have to say that um, we went um, weeks without very much sleep and we're working around the clock and I cannot say enough about what it was like to work with my colleagues uh, both in the U.S. government but in the Japanese uh, uh, embassy, the, our colleagues uh, in the Gaima Show, uh, in the Prime Minister's office and uh, in the military. Um, many people talk about the burden uh, of the military, the U.S. military in uh, Japan or the burden or the unnaturalness of stationing foreign troops on, uh, uh, on another shore. And there is truth in that. And in fact, many uh, Japanese friends uh, really, I think, had forgotten uh, some of the potential purposes of U.S. forces uh, in a crisis. And what's wonderful about this experience was uh, for a very clear example of how uh, we, working together with our Japanese counterparts and colleagues, could respond uh, uh, to this incredible challenge. And to date, we've done a number of things in response to challenges like this in the Asian Pacific region. The recent flooding in Thailand, the tragedies in Aceh, but nothing has compared with the rapidity, the dexterity, and the intensity of the American response, again, working with Japanese colleagues on this. And I'm proud to say that I played a very small role uh, here in the United States, working principally with my dear friend uh, Ichiro Fujisaki, the ambassador, who was tireless and determined, no matter what, to do what was best for Japan, to do what was best for Japan. So. In the future, I will always be able to look back on this experience with some uh, great pride and a real sense of achievement. I'd just like to say two couple of quick things about this overall effort. Um, uh, first is what's interesting about a crisis like this is who it calls on uh, to serve, how people decide they want to serve. One of the most impressive examples was a good friend, Rusty Deming, uh, a, a tremendous diplomat, a person who had earned a well-deserved retirement. And when this happened, he basically said, you can count on me. And for months, he was the person that was at his desk the longest, who'd helped us and me personally, still learning about certain aspects of the State Department, how to navigate through very complex waters. Uh, I think the Alliance will owe him and others just an enormous debt of gratitude for stepping in in its time of need. But principally for our event today, uh, the person uh, that I want to thank the most is Mike Green. I think he recognized uh, immediately thereafter, after the initial week or so, that not only will, would we need uh, as a, a partnership and alliance and as a nation to respond in the immediate uh, uh, aftermath of this tragedy, but that we would need a long-term strategy working with the Japanese uh, government and the Japanese people to redevelop, to rebuild, and to think about a whole host of issues ranging from energy to the kind of economy and the linkages between Japan and uh, the global economy as a whole. Uh, and the person who had thought about the most, who was most seized with this, was Mike Green. 
and absolutely determined to put together this extraordinary task force that brings together key players in Japan uh, and uh, the United States on the corporate, finance, and government uh, level to consider how best we can work together uh, to uh, deal with the long-term challenges that Japan will face in this part uh, of its beautiful country. Um, uh, you will find a list of highly innovative uh, suggestions and ideas for how our two countries can uh, work together. And the overarching message uh, fundamentally is that Japan is open for business and that it is essential for the business communities, not only of the United States and Japan, but of Korea and other countries around Asia to understand the potential for investment and engagement uh, in the time ahead. Um, I have to say, I think, as you all know, that there is some uh, extensive talk currently in Japan about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, 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 we are um, encouraged, even excited, by, by those discussions. This is obviously a matter for Japan uh, uh, to decide on its way forward, uh, but nevertheless, we were following it closely and we look forward to working with Japanese colleagues as they make decisions on very consequential matters. But I can simply say that we welcome opportunities for deeper strategic interaction, not just diplomatically, not just politically, but uh, at the root of what makes our two highly innovative, industrious uh, countries move uh, in the economic realm. Uh, uh, Secretary Clinton uh, had a chance to uh, meet and talk with some of the people on this effort. I think as you, and you all know, um, her uh, mother passed away recently. Deputy Secretary Nides is uh, thrilled to be engaged in this effort. We'll be with you as well. Um, I just want to say that um, we in the U.S. government, working with this team and others, are determined not to let this moment pass. We recognize that the immediate challenges uh, of uh, uh, Tamadachi and uh, the nuclear crisis have passed. But there are urgent steps that need to be taken. There's more work that needs to be done. There are still people that struggle. And there is enormous work of relevance for the U.S.-Japan relationship that we are committed to doing. I know of no report of any kind on any subject that offers more poignant, effective observations about how to channel that uh, cooperation in um, useful uh, ways, guided by previous experience, guided by um, uh, a, a wisdom of what has worked previously in U.S.-Japan relationships, and as importantly, what hasn't. So I just want to thank Mike Green, I want to thank John Hamry, and all of the players uh, in the Kadon Ren on the Japanese side and on the American side for taking uh, time out of busy schedules to work on something that we all cherish, which is uh, the U.S.-Japan relationship and principally uh, uh, the wonderful people uh, of Japan. So, Mike, I thank you very much for this. Uh, uh, I urge all of you to look at it closely, to consider um, uh, its conclusions, but as importantly, as individuals, think what you can do as well to support this important effort. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, for being here. As I have said time and again, we are coming back now, but not only by ourselves. Your assistance really made the difference. That meant a lot. We'll never forget that you stood with us at our most difficult moment. The Japanese people cherish your friendship and solidarity. Your rescue team, your forces, were out there for search and rescue. Your government, nuclear Experts were there to give us technical and expert 
advisors. Your government in Washington, the core was Kirk Campbell and his team. I knew the word 24-7 before, but I really have seen that. And they have worked as if, if this disaster was theirs. And that was really moving and touching to see that. Thank you very much, Kurt, and your team, including Russ Deming, who Kurt Campbell grabbed from his retirement, twisted arm, I don't know how he did it, but uh, really, you made the difference. And your people really helped us, including the kids, made a huge contribution, and that helped us a lot, financially as well as mentally. So, representing Japan, I would like to extend our gratitude. Now, we are seeing a new assistance in terms of intellectual and strategic advice the report. I think the report has several characteristics for, if I may say, one, this is the result of top pundits of this country. <coughs> Second, covering broad range of issues. If you look at it, you'll know that it covers for energy, health, IT, uh, disaster relief, you cover everything. Third, it's forward-looking, future-oriented, and mid and long-term. Fourthly, it's objective, at the same time, very friendly, partner-like report, if I may say. I think this will be an excellent reference for our continuing elaboration of reconstruction strategy. I would call this a book of wisdom. In a nutshell, I would say, CSIS, Mike Green, they've done it again. So thank you very much. And all of you here, thank you very much for being here to show the gratitude. This is a little token of gratitude, but I prepared this wristband. However, uh, this says uh, gratitude, friendship, and bond. But uh, coming out here, I asked uh, my embassy staff, I'm going to distribute this here, and uh, they said, uh, you are too generous and you are giving out everything, so we don't have any more. <laughs> however, however, I'm ordering it now. So uh, those who have signed up to this uh, meeting, and you'll get it later. But thank you very much again. Thank you. Um, Kurt uh, Fujisaki Taishi, thank you for your generous comments. Thank you for your participation, your staff's participation. Thank you for tolerating the um, unsolicited views of uh, experts in the private sector, civil society, and think tanks. Um, we're going to hear a message from the chairman of the task force, uh, Jim McInerney of Boeing. So please direct your attention to the screens. Uh, Mr. McInerney um, signed on right away to help. Um, and because of that, we were able to attract uh, some leading um, corporate and civil society leaders in the United States. And we're grateful for that. I am Jim McNerney from the Boeing Company, and I have the honor of chairing the CSIS Task Force, the Partnership for Recovery and a Stronger Future. Today, I am pleased to be participating in the release of the Task Force report. I am sorry that I cannot be there with you for the culmination of our work. Last March, my heart and the heart's 
of millions of people worldwide went out to the people of Japan in the wake of the enormous destruction that was caused by the earthquake and tsunami in Tohaku. Many of us wanted to help in any way we could. So when CSIS President John Hamry invited me to chair this task force, I immediately said yes. And it has been my honor to work with such a dedicated group of leaders. First, I want to thank Kedanran Chairman Hiromaso Yonekura for his leadership and commitment to strengthening the Japan-U.S. alliance. Chairman Yonekura and the entire Kedanran have been vital leaders and valued partners in this project. I also want to thank the task force directors, Michael J. Green and Kiyuaki Aburaki, as well as the six working group leaders and all the task force participants for the leadership and expertise they have contributed to this important project. The report we are unveiling today is a prime example of the deep spirit of partnership that exists between Japan and the United States. From the beginning, it was my hope that our work would properly honor this abiding relationship. Our mission was critical, to make recommendations aimed at enabling the long-term economic recovery of Japan in the context of a strengthened U.S.-Japan alliance. We all believed that the task force's work would send a clear signal to the Japanese people that they would not be alone on the long path to recovery and reconstruction. Our work was inspired by a shared sense of responsibility among the participating Japanese and American experts, starting with the Kedandran. This report's recommendations were developed in close collaboration with a range of sectors in Japan, including private industry, civil society, academia, and government and political leaders. Many of these recommendations call for joint Japanese-U.S. actions that will further strengthen the alliance while addressing the challenges at hand. During a recent visit to Japan, I was encouraged to learn from my discussions there that government leaders are already considering policies that would, among other things, strengthen the private sector's ability to respond more effectively. This is also a key recommendation of the task force report. Japan has already taken enormous strides toward cleaning up the stricken region and addressing the immediate needs of its people. As the Japanese government begins to deal with longer term reconstruction, I hope that the task force's recommendations, informed by the experiences of both nations, after other large-scale disasters, will be of value to decision makers. Thank you again for your partnership and for being here today as we unveil this important report. Um, I understand Secretary Campbell has to leave. I want to ask the press to please let him uh, make his escape. We're going to move now, thank you, Kurt, to a uh, panel of the task force working group leaders if you could join me up here, um, colleagues, uh, to go through, s highlight some of the recommendations uh, from the report. Um, so if I can invite Stacy and Stanley and Jane and Steve and Tim. So when we um, formed the task force, um, we uh, uh, understood that we would be working on this over the course of about six months, and that during that time, uh, the Japanese government, um, Keidanren, Keizai Doyukai, or the organizations in Japan would be drawing up detailed blueprints uh, to deal with the um, cleanup, the recovery, 
the disaster. So we did not try to create a, a blueprint so much as a framework for uh, thinking about the medium and longer term uh, challenges, um, bringing to bear our experiences. I said, as I said, not all good. Uh, we learned a lot about what not to do in Three Mile Island, Katrina, um, and from that, um, uh, hopefully some wisdom, um, and to think about ways that we could build on the partnerships between civil societies and private sector that, that came out of 311 and sustain that, um, to stand with Japan as it goes through recovery and, and a, to a reconstruction and a stronger future and to strengthen our alliance. And we divided our, our, our uh, task force uh, uh, in, into six working groups um, to try to have a more in-depth examination of each of these areas. Um, and we were very pleased that uh, some well-recognized experts uh, agreed to take charge of these working groups in each area. Um, the six groups um, are uh, represented here except for uh, two, um, uh, but let me briefly introduce them. Tim Adams, the former Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, well known to any of you who follow international economic affairs and now the, the, the principal at the Lindsay Group, agreed to take on uh, the working group that would look at um, fiscal questions, macroeconomic questions, and the, and the economic policy dimension. Um, Steve Morrison, who leads the global health uh, work here at CSIS, had already been working in partnership with um, some Japanese health uh, uh, and public policy institutes and agreed to take on uh, an examination of the longer term health implications, challenges, and opportunities for working together. He worked with Brian Biles and other experts um, here at CSIS and, and, uh, and elsewhere in the United States. Um, Stacy White, uh, together with Joey Booth uh, and others, uh, Joey leads the uh, Disaster Management Institute at LSU, lots of experience uh, with Katrina, and Stacy is an expert on disaster relief uh, globally and led that uh, task force. Um, Jane Nakano uh, and David Pumphrey and Mike Wallace and others here at CSIS uh, led on the energy task force looking at the nuclear piece and also long-term energy supply and demand and strategy questions. Um, we had two other working groups not represented here. I may briefly summarize the findings at the end. Uh, Sachs Sakota and Rich Armitage uh, took the lead in the security policy working group which examined the lessons learned from Operation Tomodachi. And uh, Randy Martin, uh, senior uh, official in, the, uh, in Mercy Corps, the, 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 the highly respected international NGO, led a group that focused on how to build civil society cooperation. And in fact, he is actually, he's not here because he's following his own recommendation. And uh, Mercy Corps has uh, made him the president of their Asia operations based in Japan, uh, which is why he can't be with us uh, today. Um, and then we're going to hear from each of the uh, working group leaders um, the highlights of their work. Um, and then uh, Stanley Roth from, from Boeing, who helped us throughout on behalf of uh, Mr. McInerney and Kyo Abaraki, who was the co-director with me, um, we'll have some brief comments and, and then we'll open it for Q&A and, and try to answer what questions we can and you all have the report in front of you, but let me turn it over first to Tim. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mike. It's, um, it's an honor to be on the panel uh, on the dais today and have served with such a distinguished group of scholars uh, in a, uh, looking at a country which is very dear to my heart. I've spent uh, most of my professional life traveling to Japan. I have many good friends there. I have clients there. And it is a place that I have observed up close and a place that I have enormous respect. And, um, you know, I remember I was in Singapore on March 11th at the airport uh, waiting to fly back to the United States and watching the, the devastating of events that day. And it's still seared into my memory. Uh, it's also a, an honor and pleasure to be talking about something other than the Greek debt crisis today. So this is a nice respite from Europe's uh, uh, travails. Uh, you know, the, the challenge for Japan is that prior to March 11th, the country faced uh, enormous economic challenges. Uh, we had seen decades of subpar growth, uh, high levels of uh, sovereign debt, a debt to GDP ratio of 200%. Uh, uh, deflationary pressures, anemic consumption, a whole host of ills which had challenged the political system uh, for years. In fact, there's a USA Today article today that says, you know, could it happen here? Talking about the events in Japan 
and are we, the U.S., uh, suffering from similar maladies, and are we, uh, are we uh, prone to make the same mistakes and, uh, and have a similar history? And then, of course, add to this the uh, horrific events of March 11th that slammed the Japanese economy through a disruption to the supply chains and then brought into question the issue of sustainable and, and cost-effective supply of energy, which others, uh, energy experts here, will, will talk about. And it was, uh, it was a, a hit to the economy that was felt around the world. Uh, obviously, it had a, a global macro effect. Uh, even U.S. officials, uh, including Ben Bernanke and others, use that as one of the rationales for why the U.S. economy has suffered so much over the last couple of quarters. So it wasn't just a Japan-centered event, it was a global economic event on top of an already uh, fragile economic trajectory. Now, despite these conditions, despite these challenges, the political system, which often uh, uh, seemingly paralyzed uh, to make big decisions, uh, was able to rise to the occasion. We have seen a fairly robust response. We've had a number of supplementary budgets. There do appear to be guidelines put in place on how reconstruction will be undertaken. Uh, and there is uh, some agreement on how reconstruction will be paid for, which again is very important given the debt to GDP ratio and, and, uh, and the, the weak anemic growth. Uh, the response to the crisis has really at two levels. One is a micro level and one is a broader macro level. At a micro level, and, and you can see from the recommendations made in the report, we look at and make, uh, uh, make recommendations about, uh, about uh, implementing um, an economic zone by picking some, and there's a variety of different ways to do this, and there is no one right method, but finding a certain geographic region and putting in place a series of incentives to drive capital uh, to, that, uh, to that geographic region. You know, there's an old adage that uh, capital is a coward. It goes where it's treated well and it flees where it's treated badly. So the concept is find the area and treat capital well and do it in a way that incentivizes, if you allow me to use it as a verb, incentivizes capital to flow in, whether it's domestic capital or foreign capital, it doesn't really matter, and then also accompany that with a change in regulations which promotes labor force participation and, again, business startups and risk-taking. So that's at the micro level. We do appear, uh, we, it does appear that the Japanese government is embracing the concept, and we just need to see what the details look like, but I'm optimistic. At a macro level, uh, change also has to come, because while change at the micro level is a necessary condition, it's not sufficient macroeconomic conditions need to improve as well. And here in the report, we've offered a, a number of suggestions, no surprises. Uh, I think the, uh, the prescription for change in Japan is well known. So uh, whether it's the IMF's Article 4 or other assessments of Japan, this is quite similar actually. Uh, but some of them uh, we noted were to rethink uh, the tax code in a way that, again, uh, uh, gives incentive to growth and capital formation and labor force participation, you know, and marry it with a fiscal policy that, that certainly looks at the budgetary needs of Japan over the medium and long term and the need to uh, deal with uh, uh, sovereign debt. So look for ways to uh, offset expenditures with other expenditure cuts, but put in place a tax system that is incredibly efficient, that is pro-growth, that uh, is very supportive of the corporate sector and again uh, promotes labor force participation. Given uh, Japan's demographic challenges, it's important to see a higher level of labor force participation. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is an energy component. One of, the, one of the concerns we heard repeatedly from Japanese industry is a concern about the reliability and sustainability and the cost effectiveness of energy. And obviously there is an enormous debate raging in Japan as there are in other countries about the future of nuclear power. And if not nuclear, then what? And is thermal energy a cost effective uh, replacement? But there's real concern among J uh, Japanese industry that if, uh, if Japan moves to a different energy source and it is less cost effective 
then that will force Japanese industry to move jobs to other uh, platforms around the world that offer a much cheaper manufacturing uh, input profile. Uh, and then trade policy. Uh, Ambassador uh, Kirk Campbell mentioned uh, that uh, TPP is on, uh, is on the radar screen. I, I don't have any inside details about where the current Japanese government is thinking. I know we do have uh, APEC uh, about 10 days from now. Uh, I'm encouraged by what little I have heard about the way in which Japan is thinking about uh, embracing TPP. I think it's absolutely the right policy, but that is for Japan to decide. But irrespective of whether it's this particular policy or some broader policy, Japan would certainly benefit by more openness on the trade front. Japan has some of the greatest exporting companies in the world. But that same sense of prowess and efficiency and effectiveness that they deploy around the world could also be realized at the domestic level by simply opening up and revolutionizing the service sector. So it, it, in a sense, Japan can still benefit enormously from opening up and engaging the, the global trading system, and I hope that next week we will see that. Uh, I'll stop there uh, because I want to make sure that the, the other uh, participants have plenty of time, but I, I think the, the, the main takeaway is that there were enormous macro challenges. This crisis exacerbated those challenges. The government has responded. Much more needs to be done at the micro level. But the old macro challenges that were there before are still there. And only so much can be done at the micro level until the macro issues are taking, uh, taken on. And this government appears to be serious and sober in its assessment of these challenges and, and is endeavoring to take them on. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, first, a note of thanks to Mike Green for organizing this and Keo. Abaraki and uh, Tachi Yamada, the former president of Global Health at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, kindly agreed to chair the health working group and was very integral to that. Uh, he can't be with us today, but since his regards, uh, I also want to express my gratitude to my partner in pulling this together, Brian Biles from GW University, who's been very integral, and to the Health and Global Policy Institute in Tokyo. Um, we will be doing an event, in fact, uh, in Fukushima City jointly, a CSIS and HGPI event on Friday, November 11th in Fukushima City on this very report with a focus on the, Mike will be there, a focus on the broad recommendations and a focus on the health, which I'll get to in just a moment. We have three recommendations. I'll hit those in a moment. Let me first say that um, in terms of core findings, um, I think probably the most important core finding of, of this chapter on health has to do with low-dose long-term radiation exposure and the health implications in the Fukushima prefecture and the other eight prefectures affected by this. The experiences that Japan is having uh, uh, have an import that extends well beyond Japan. Clearly those experiences in terms of trying to wrestle with the uh, uncertainties over the scientific standards for safety, over wrestling with how preparedness for crises can be improved in the future, and how to communicate to a frightened and distrustful public uh, those challenges that are that are being uh, uh, addressed today uh, in in Japan have import, obviously for the Japanese society, but they have very strong import for the many many other countries that are home to the 450 plus uh, uh, nuclear power plants today. Many of which are aging, and many of which are in situations that are far less well managed than uh, than in Japan and the other countries that are building the current 60. Uh, plants that are under construction. This low-dose low long-term radiation is an under-recognized and a very important global health challenge um, and how we uh, understand the lessons coming out of this will have great importance. Um, many promising U.S.-Japan uh, health initiatives have advanced in this period. People uh, on bo on, in both Japan and the United States did not wait around for uh, direction before they launched these the GE Health Initiative is detailed. Project Hope's work in Iwate in partnership with Iwate authorities. Columbia University Professor Homa's initiative with the Fukushima Medical University focused on mental health issues. These are very important trailblazing initiatives that we should recognize and build upon. 2012 is going to be a year of decision. A lot of key decisions have not yet been determined 
and we're going to need to be very patient and watchful in looking at how Tohoku copes with the 30 percent of the health infrastructure that was destroyed, how it's rebuilt, how it deals with a very large, elderly, dislocated, traumatized population, what kind of services, and how it deals with the continued radiation exposure. Um, U.S. initiatives will be important, but they're going to have to align very closely with Japanese policy as it evolves, and they'll have to be aligned with important independent Japanese partners. Our first recommendation is around low-dose long-term radiation. I think I've already indicated that we don't really have a clear uh, sense of the scientific standards for safety, nor do we understand particularly well the questions around adequate preparedness for crises and how to communicate and sustain public trust in the midst of a crisis. We're proposing that there be an independent international study of these issues that draws together Japanese, American, and other key experts. We think this is very important. We think that the Institute of Medicine here in the United States would be a very good vehicle for that, but it's not, we're not making an exclusive recommendation. We simply cite this as one very worthy prospect to do this. We think that there is a serious trust and credibility problem and that an independent entity of this kind, if it were something that were welcomed uh, by the uh, Japanese government, could advance and carry forward its work in 18 to 24 months and greatly advance our knowledge on those key areas where I've said we do not have answers at hand today. The second recommendation is around reconstructing health services and the health infrastructure in Tohoku, and what we recommend is that a high-level consortium of American interests partner uh, with Japanese organizations at the national and prefecture and community levels in trying to build back better to create uh, regional pilots that can have broader national significance to bring about more efficient and integrated health systems and to bring about uh, information technology and electronic records which have been highly problematic in this period revealed to be so during the crisis when many people who were dependent on records for, for their access to medications were deprived of those because they were paper and they were destroyed. Third is around mental health services for the vulnerable populations. And we're, develop, we're proposing that there be strong twi strengthened twinning arrangements over the next three to five years between U.S. and Japanese medical institutions. We believe that these clinical services will continue to be very, very important. As I said earlier, Columbia University, Dr. Homa, has already begun pioneering some very important work in this area with Fukushima Medical University um, in the Fukushima Prefecture. Uh, these are very promising, and I think that there's ample opportunity and expertise for building those relationships. Thank you so much. Hello. I also wanted to thank Mike Green and everyone at the Japan Chair for, for pulling this together and also to extend thanks to those persons who participated in the Disaster Recovery and Preparedness Working Group. Um, we met twice over the summer and, and people were very thoughtful and uh, very generous with their time. Um, one of the first things we wanted to do uh, post 311 was to, to do recommendations that were really not just oratory, not just the laundry list of recommendations after a disaster of what should be done. Um, we wanted to focus on things that were doable. We wanted to focus on things that could capitalize on the U.S.-Japan experiences in Kobe, in Katrina, and, and use those together to, to look at the situation in Tohoku. Um, there was a pretty immediate uh, acknowledgement amongst the group that immediate relief activities um, had been competently dealt with by Japanese um, authorities. There's a continued, as, as many of you know, issue of, um, of housing and land available for housing. Um, and there is a small number of persons who are still living in evacuation shelters. But we considered that, given the legislative and the political issues involved in that, and that the Jap Japanese government was on top of it, we wanted to move, uh, move on from sort of immediate relief issues to look more specifically at transition from re relief to recovery and learning um, that could be shared around preparedness and mitigation efforts. Um, because the recovery in Tohoku almost immediately um, implicit in the recovery is really a reconceptualization of Tohoku, there were many uh, similarities with what was going on in New Orleans. Um, 
and many challenges that the government has to deal with, um, which were very similar to what U.S. Uh, federal and state uh, governments in Louisiana and city officials in New Orleans had to deal with as well. Um, they, there's, a, there's a balance that has to be made in recovery between return to normalcy for people so that they can get on with their lives and their livelihoods, but you also have to um, leave room for change and, and economic reinvention in the region. Um, there's also the tension between a speed of recovery, moving quickly so that pathologies don't arise, um, whether they're health, whether they're economic, whether they're social, um, but being deliberate in your actions and consulting um, affected populations. A third tension we talked about was the collective relocation of communities versus small-scale residential district improvements. So how do you determine um, whether you move people en masse and, and what are the implications for that in terms of economic revival, um, community ties, and, and long-term prosperity? All of this involves a very careful effort by the government to convey a predictable process for recovery that will restore confidence. So to this end, our recommendations focused on the localization of recovery decision making, not just the execution of reconstruction, but the actual decision making, bringing that to the Tohoku region. Also on the participation of affected communities, which is a science in and of itself, and on the building of networks, direct networks, between local government officials, businesses, and community members, so that there are entry points for them to share challenges and to share best practices between cities and municipalities directly affected. In addition to our, our look at tra transition to recover, we also looked at learning opportunities around preparedness and mitigation. Um, there was an acknowledgement by the group that Japanese leadership um, in this area is, you know, second to none in the world. And also an appreciation of many of the adjustments that have already, already been made by some of the technical institutions in Japan to the early warning tools since March 11. So our concentration was really on the combination of physical mitigation methods and how you combine cost-effective seawalls, uh, ducts, um, evacuation towers, etc., that can work together to actually um, improve the, uh, the ability of people to survive in a situation like this. Um, the other thing we looked at is the soft infrastructure or the human behavior. There's been a lot of talk um, since 311 about the evacuation and some of the decision making um, that individuals were confronted with, whether they went back to check on loved ones, whether they ha had the means to get elderly. Um, people out of their homes, whether they um, you know, knew exactly where to go and had the means to get there. So this is something uh, that also came up in Katrina, and it's something that I think cross-cultural analysis could actually bear um, something important after, excuse me. <laughs> um, let me regain my, uh, so this is the kind of thing where um, in Katrina and in uh, Tohoku where we could share some best practices from those two, two experiences. So I want to just go over a couple of the recommendations. Um, one of the things we called on was localizing the decision making of the cabinet office's reconstruction headquarters. This is something that they did in Indonesia post um, 2004 tsunami and this is something that they did in Pakistan after the Kashmir earthquake. And in both cases it was considered very effective in terms of keeping the politics out of the, some of the reconstruction process, minimizing corruption, and also building confidence among the local people. Another thing that I want to talk about, um, and I won't go over all of the recommendations since we don't have that much time, but one thing I've um, been, been pushing and been a strong supporter of is the opportunity to build a bilateral laboratory um, for risk reduction and recovery. In Asia, there are many different um, fora for disaster risk reduction and management learning, but they usually involve many different countries and, and they're just, you know, three-day conferences. The Indonesians and the Australians have put together a facility in Jakarta that actually is a laboratory where engineers, urban planners, uh, different tsunami experts meet together and they work on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is really where I think you're going to see tools that are directly applicable and employable by local officials. And I, th I, I think, you know, the shared identity of U.S. and Japan as two of the five 
biggest humanitarian donors in the world, and also our shared risks around the Pacific Rim, uh, it, it would be interesting to explore, I think, this kind of facility. I think it's something that could be useful. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Energy Working Group, I'd also like to uh, thank Mike Green for his leadership, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone that uh, participated in the um, Energy Working Group meeting in summer and throughout the, the course of the, the work. So um, our energy work focused on um, nuclear energy, natural gas, uh, renewable energy, and power sector. And here, and there are many recommendations, but I'd like to focus on um, just the, some of them, the key recommendations. Um, this, so the first one is the U.S.-Japan Joint Commission on Fukushima. So we're uh, essentially recommending a bilateral public-private commission that would not only streamline synergetic efforts by the U.S. and Japanese private sectors, sector that, that's already happening in Japan, but also provide both countries with a more of a systematic uh, or structured way of digesting and implementing lessons learned from Fukushima. There's actually precedence for uh, this type of bilateral uh, 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 effort. Uh, in the aftermath of uh, Three Mile Island in 1979, uh, Japanese a group of Japanese companies um, and research institutes actually provided uh, some direct funding to a DOE-led uh, effort, uh, mainly R&D efforts, to look at the decommissioning um, and uh, decontamination, as well as some of the post-accident reactor uh, situations and such. And uh, this was uh, quite beneficial for both um, sides. I mean, uh, I think the Japanese side uh, recognized that this would give them lots of insights and then data that would be used to uh, enhance the, uh, the safe operation of its nuclear power plants. But then for for both parties uh, to really contribute to the uh, safe operation around the world. And so, um, so here we're recommending something similar yet perhaps more robust. Um, and then we're also recommending a bilateral energy forum that would highlight key trends in the global energy um, market, but then also facilitate better understanding of uh, energy policies in each country, to Japan and the U.S. Uh, for example, natural gas comes to mind as some of the most um, uh, immediate topics uh, under this forum, uh, as the Japanese reliance on natural gas uh, is expected to increase in, coming, uh, in the coming years. And um, it, in, uh, interestingly enough, coincides with the North American interest in exploring uh, markets overseas. And the current, uh, as some of you are aware of, the current market uh, price differential between the Asia Pacific market and the North American market makes the trade, whether direct or um, otherwise, quite attractive. Uh, it could be a very much win-win uh, situation. And, and uh, one of the um, actually specific issues that could be brought, uh, taken up under this forum may be how participation in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, may enhance Japan's energy security through a greater access to North American natural gas. And we can certainly talk a little more about it um, uh, during the Q&A if, uh, if there's interest. Um, and lastly, there are a few uh, issues related to the power sector that are ripe for bilateral discussions and uh, uh, enhanced cooperation. The greater resiliency uh, of the sector, uh, the interconnectivity of the grids, and integration of renewable energy sources will help a country, whether Japan or the U.S. or any other country, become better prepared not only for the future demand growth, but um, against any supply disruptions, whether it's from um, another earthquake or from um, act of terrorism. Uh, we believe that to allow for greater efficiency and flexibility in the energy marketplace that would fully accommodate uh, some of the potentials that the uh, renewable energies and other diversified sources and players uh, may be able to uh, uh, contribute, the current market structure in Japan may uh, merit close examination. Additionally, we lay out in the um, energy chapter um, recommendations pertaining to, uh, say, uh, the Tohoku region become a test, uh, test bed or the hub for some of the energy efficient or clean energy technologies uh, that are being pursued by uh, both the Japanese and American um, entities. Um, so that's it for me. I see that the Deputy Secretary has already arrived, and so that he not wait too long, I'm going to limit myself to one point. And that point is just reinforcing the message that Jim McNerney made in the video 
about the key role of the private sector. When you have a chance to read the report, you'll really see that that theme is in almost every <coughs> chapter. It's not only about industry, it's also about NGOs and civil society and the roles that they can play in the recovery and the reconstruction. When some of us from the task force visited Japan, went to the region, we received impassioned pleas for investment. And it was for Japanese investment, but we were a foreign group, so it was for U.S. and foreign direct investment in general. And obviously, everybody is very sympathetic to the tragedy. The question is, are the conditions there that make the investments attractive and workable? And so I want to just reinforce the points that Tim made in his presentation, that there are steps that the Japanese government is already working on very hard and has to take, and I think will take, to make this region more attractive. That includes the special economic zones that were discussed, possible reforms or changes in tax, regulatory policy, trade liberalization, and of course, reliable energy supply. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Kyo Abraki, and I really uh, appreciate this opportunity. And what can I share is that uh, uh, closely related to Stanley's point. I mean that the strengthen the U.S.-Japan relations, strengthen the Japan's future based on vitality of the private sector. And uh, Kedanlen sets the kind of goal. It is that uh, uh, three percent uh, economic growth in nominal terms, and two percent economic growth in real terms. We think this is possible if the strength private sector will be fully utilized under the strengthened international linkages, under the strengthened partnership with other countries. For us, the most important partnership with the United States. And the people uh, in the Kedanland, the CEO, uh, by Chairman, Chairman, by Chairman Kedanland, really appreciate the opportunity next week, November 9th, uh, we, we are going to have a this, you know, uh, intensive discussion in, in, in Kedan and Tokyo with Kedan uh, CSS representative, John Hamre, uh, Steve Morrison, and Mike Green. And uh, we, they are really looking forward to kind of uh, discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you all. When we, uh, uh, when I say we, uh, all of us on the stage, John Hamry, uh, Jim McInerney, and other members of the task force, decided to do this, um, everybody had a lot on their plate and everyone up on stage here made a lot of room on their plate to devote not a day or two, but basically six months of sustained attention to prepare this task force and um, by implication to keep working on this with um, colleagues in Japan as we go forward. There were two other working groups, um, uh, not represented here because the working group uh, leaders are on travel. Um, Sachs Coda and Rich Armitage, um, Chip Gregson and others uh, led a working group on the security uh, relationship, the implications for the alliance. And the bottom line uh, there is that um, Operation Tomodachi, uh, 100,000 self-defense forces, over 20,000 U.S. personnel, was the most complex joint and combined operation we had ever done together. And we did it quickly. Um, did it particularly for some of the self-defense forces at, uh, at personal risk. Uh, it was, some of these operations were dangerous. Sent a very strong reassuring signal to the Japanese people and, and frankly a very uh, important signal to the region about how strong our alliance was. But as we looked at this, we, you know, those of us who work on security never look on the upside. We always look on the downside and considered um, what if this had been a more, even more complex crisis, a crisis not responding to a natural disaster but one where there was somebody on the other side intending you harm. And many of the operations were coordinated through open emails. Uh, many of the US um, uh, initiatives were led by um, very senior three and four stars coming out of Hawaii, the kind of things that would be very hard to do uh, in, a, in a security crisis. And so we gamed through and made some recommendations, as I know both governments are, about thinking through the lessons learned from this very successful operation in terms of other things we might face together. Um, because these are, after all, the Japan self-defense forces, and the nation's defense is their first mission. Um, on the civil society side, um, I think, you know, we sent a group to Tohoku. We, we, we spent time with civil society groups there and in Tokyo. Japan's civil society sector is small, but, man, are they active. They were very, very um, dynamic. But they filled niche areas, we found, and don't have the kind of scale or uh, experience or capacity of some of the larger NGOs based in the United States, like Mercy Corps um, or Save the Children or others. And so Randy Martin led a group 
um, and uh, uh, made some recommendations on how the governments, the private sector, um, and American civil society groups can partner with Japanese NGOs um, to help them build on this experience, um, to help them learn some important things that American NGOs are good at, like fundraising, uh, but also to take their experience together uh, abroad uh, and, 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 and use that to be more effective at responding to crises and disasters in the region where, where Japanese NGOs like, uh, like Peace Winds and others are very active. So those were the um, other two working groups. Um, if the Deputy Secretary will indulge us, we, we might take a few questions. Um, Deputy Secretary Tom Nides, of course, leads the, um, uh, he's the point man on, on this entire effort for the U.S. government. Um, his um, staff has been active and enthusiastic participants in our work. Maya Seiden, a special assistant, is basically Japanese. She, she grew up in Japan, and, and uh, Tom has been very helpful. We'll hear from him in a moment, um, I suppose, our closing benediction for the day. But, but first, um, with your indulgence, I think we can take uh, some questions, if you have them, for the panel uh, on the, the briefings you just heard on the working group um, on next steps. Um, the floor is open for a few moments, uh, a few minutes, if people want to ask questions. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Morrison. Mr. Morrison, you had... Thanks. Uh, Mr. Morrison, you had mentioned a, quote, serious trust and credibility problem, unquote. I'm, I'm just a little unsure of exactly what that's focused on and what you're, what you're addressing specifically. So if you could give some details about what exactly has that problem, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, before I do that, I'd, I, wanna, uh, I neglected to thank Nick Sengenji uh, and, and Suzanne Brundage for the work that they contributed to this. Nick coordinated all the different pieces, and Suzanne was absolutely integral on our side on the health piece. Um, we were. Uh, uh, Mike referenced the um, uh, the visit in June. Uh, we were uh, uh, in uh, Tohoku uh, and then uh, had the occasion to I had the occasion with HGPI staff to to circulate in the three prefectures uh, for several days after that. Um, and uh, uh, what we experienced there was, a uh, very dramatic expression of, of anger, frustration, and bewilderment uh, with respect to the, uh, in the Fukushima area with respect to radiation. Uh, the, I think there are several, and we outline in the, in the report, there are several root causes to this, one of which is the lack of clear standards. Uh, one, another was the, um, uh, the withholding of data at critical moments, another was the confusing um, uh, policy uh, positions that were taken um, at different points. And then there was the revelation that, in fact, the, uh, the releases were quite a bit larger than what had been originally estimated and then uh, blown in, inland. And then over time, over the subsequent months, you've had the discovery of the, of the hot spots uh, scattered across now. Um, I think there are about 170 communities that are in the process of being decontaminated. In July, in mid-July, we hosted an HGPI delegation here. We had a forum in this space of five prominent uh, Japanese health experts uh, from very diverse backgrounds, and, and that, is, uh, that was videotaped and broadcast. It's on our website. Uh, it was a very dramatic expression of the degree to which particularly mothers uh, in fear of their children's status in the affected areas had begun to qu very quietly mobilize quite a strong bit of migration out of the affected areas um, by uh, mothers and children in particular. So we, we heard this, we, 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 we saw the evidence and the proof of this uh, in several areas. The last point I would make is that we were, there was a very broad diversity of folks both inside government and outside government who appealed to us uh, with respect to the idea of an independent um, of an independent expert committee that could attempt to try and resolve some of these issues, um, and and that's reflected in the in the recommendation. Thank you very much. In the back there. Yes, thanks. I'm Harlan Allman. Uh, question I have is, what were your recommendations to deal with uh, used nuclear fuel, not just in the Fukushima region but throughout Japan? Could you comment on? Uh, your ideas there. The used fuel, not so 
I mean, the Japanese government does have a um, plan and uh, institutional uh, setup to um, uh, to process. I mean, regardless, I mean, since before Fukushima, um, but I'm not sure if uh, I mean they do have an organization called NUMO, uh, which is uh, which looks at um, both the um, the reprocessing, uh, of, which looks at the uh, underground um, repository um, option. I mean, so there is a process in place, uh, but specific to Fukushima or any fuels at places that have sustained a uh, uh, degree, a severe degree of damage, I think you know there are uh, lots of uh, things that are being looked at uh, by both the Japanese but then U.S. national lab type experts. Um, um, you know, the timing of it, I mean, uh, most recently, the, the uh, decommissioning efforts, um, uh, um, it, it was determined it will take about, uh, I mean, a couple of decades. I mean, the, if you look at the TMI uh, incident, it did take a couple of decades as, as well. So but it does require very de uh, deliberate, uh, very comprehensive uh, uh, plan, strategy, as opposed to ad hoc, uh, you know, day by day or, you know, uh, uh, sort of a you know sort of a reactionary uh, approach. I mean, I, not that I, I'm not saying that there is uh, such, but so um, that's still a part of what uh, we can certainly uh, contribute to the Japanese side. Thank you. One of the other um, uh, aspects of the energy report, I think, um, worth highlighting uh, again uh, is um, that the nuclear industry in Japan. Um, obviously is under a lot of siege right now, uh, and there's great uh, debate and anxiety, understandably, and, and as Tim and others pointed out, not only in Japan, in many countries. We tried to, uh, in our report, while remaining um, sensitive to that and focusing in particular on the long-term low-dose radiation challenge, we tried to help frame some of the other implications, uh, uh, not only of, um, uh, of, of, us, of, of moving quickly out of nuclear power for Japan's economic growth, and there are studies that we cite on the impact that would have on, on growth figures, but also thinking about Japan's role in, in the international nonproliferation and nuclear safety regimes. Um, our concern was that if Japan, uh, from an international perspective, if Japan pulled out uh, uh, rapidly uh, of the nuclear power sector, if Japan stopped uh, implementing plans to get into nuclear exports, it would um, uh, significantly uh, uh, weaken Japan's voice in, 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 in nonproliferation and in efforts to have international safety standards at a time when there are going to be hundreds of nuclear power plants built around the world over the coming decades, many of them built by or operated by countries with a, shall we say, less rigorous um, safety or transparency record than Japan has. So we thought it was important to highlight in the middle of this de bit of debate in Japan um, the international dimension and the, and the very important positive role Japan plays and will play as a, a leading voice on nonproliferation and nuclear safety and standards around the world. Um, any, any last questions? And yes, sure. David. Uh, da David Bowling with the uh, Mike Mansfield Foundation. Uh, Mike, we've heard a lot about how well the self-defense forces and the U.S. military work together in Operation Tomodachi. Could you share with us one story that really illustrates that in your mind? There are many, and, and I, I have to say we heard the most uh, impressive ones when we were in Tohoku, as some of you have uh, may have as well. Um, uh, Operation um, uh, Soul Train, where the U.S. Air Force and, and Marine Corps, working with the Self-Defense Forces, reopened the Sendai Airport basically in, I think it was 48 hours. We have it in our report, but it was in about two days. Um, you couldn't land in the airport, so the, the initial operation involved paradrops. Um, and within two days, they had that airport operating. An Australian C-17 came in with supplies. And, and it was an amazing thing because it was so fast. And it probably saved lives uh, by allowing these large transport aircraft to come in. But also, it's an extremely complex operation um, and uh, demonstrated um, not just capability. What it demonstrated was trust that there wasn't a, a whole lot of bureaucratic red tape between U.S. and Japanese forces, U.S. and Japanese government to do this. I think that was important in terms of saving lines, important in terms of showing quick response. But again, as I said, it, it was a useful signal to the entire region that in spite of difficulties or distances or differences we may have had over Tenma or other issues, this is an alliance that actually functions 
I think it showed it functions in, in, in ways people hadn't fully appreciated it in terms of its effectiveness. There are other stories I've heard that, I, that Sachs should tell and would tell if he were here, but he going through the U.S. Embassy bumped into somebody he knew, State Department officer, uh, who was there working around the clock on Operation Tomodachi, and Sack asked him, aren't you working in Iraq? Because he was supposed to be in Iraq. And this guy took his leave. He had served in Japan before. He was on leave from Iraq, and he left his vacation and, and volunteered to go into the embassy. There were a lot of stories like that for U.S. forces and State Department and other AID officials that are quite, um, quite impressive. Um, thank you, and thank you to the, to the working group chiefs. And uh, you know, Steve mentioned Nick Sanchini, the deputy director of the Japan chair. He was the coordinator for this project. He, he made this entire thing happen, uh, pulled the entire thing together, and we all owe him an enormous, enormous debt of thanks. And we're going to keep working on this. Uh, Steve mentioned the conference we're doing in Fukushima um, in about a week. Uh, John Hamry is actually there in Japan now. He's doing a, a, a dialogue on nuclear safety, uh, learning from 311. Uh, we will be hosting in early December uh, a meeting here with Japanese counterparts on nuclear crisis management. We'll be do doing other things in these different spaces, civil society, energy, and our respective programs uh, to try to sustain this cooperation. And please don't hesitate to let us know if you'd like to participate uh, in any of these dialogues. We are very privileged and, and, and fortunate that, um, first of all, that Tom Nides uh, cares about Japan so much. If you look at his resume, you'll say he's worked in the Hill, in the private sector, at USTR, spent a lot of time on Japan. And as I understand it, the Secretary essentially put him on point uh, to uh, help uh, uh, the two governments work together and build a larger framework for cooperation. Um, and he has, uh, in a very busy day, because the Secretary is gone, as I understand it, volunteered to, 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 to come and, and, uh, and offer some closing thoughts uh, on uh, the way forward in our alliance. So, so thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, this uh, uh, demonstrates, this event demonstrates a remarkable extent of the cooperation that uh, we have with Japan after the devastating disasters on 311. I'm quite frankly, I'm honored to ha play a very small part in in the recovery. And I'm, I had the opportunity actually to review the report earlier today, and as I like to say, this report is smart comprehensive, and it's a roadmap for supporting reconstruction and the long-term recovery of Japan. And I want to thank you guys, um, Mike in particular, for the leadership that you've shown to put this together and all of you who have taken your time to do this. This is uh, not only important to the State Department and the Japanese people, but it's what we do, and we do it uh, quite well. And I want to also thank my uh, friend, Ambassador Fujisaki, who's here. Um, I want you to know during the crisis, I would bet you uh, – the good ambassador probably was at our office three or four times a day. Uh, he would go to a meeting, he would go back to the embassy, he would come back and ask for more. Um, and uh, there's no better uh, friend that we have uh, in the United States uh, than the ambassador, but quite frankly, there's no better representative the Japanese people have in the United States than the ambassador. So thank you, I'm honored that you're here. When I visited Japan with Secretary Clinton, um, with Tom Donahue of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce about a month after the tsunami, there was un unspeakable uh, devastation, as you all know. But even then, we saw the resilience and the unbroken spirit of the Japanese people. And we saw the friendship between our countries grow deeper amid the wreckage of those uh, early days. The Japanese self-defense forces and the American military worked in the close complement to distribute much needed supplies, as you've just heard. They stood side by side to dig through the rubble in Sendai. Nuclear experts, rescue workers, and civilian engineers from the United States immediately boarded planes to help our Japanese colleagues. When it mattered most, Americans stepped up across the board. And quite frankly, we're very proud of that. But there's no doubt in my mind that Japan would have done the same thing for us, because they have. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina and Rita, the Japanese were among the first responders on the scene. New Yorkers still remember the Japanese rescue workers at Ground Zero at 9-11. Our countries do not hesitate to lean on each other in crises because we have invested in our relationship for more than six decades. 
And we now know we stand up to the height, indeed, in forms of the cornerstone of our commitment to the Asia-Pacific region. And each time we are tested, our nations emerge stronger, better prepared, and closer than ever. This CIS task force proved that again. CSIS is, was not just an academic exercise. It was, I'd like to say, a labor of love, a reflection of our intention to stand by Japan through the rebuilding and beyond. And as a recovering businessman myself, I think that one of the best ways we can do that is by spreading the message that Japan is open for business. To that end, we launched the Partnership for Reconstruction in April to unite the public and private sectors in both countries in support. The outpouring of support since then has been outstanding and, quite frankly, inspiring. American corporations have donated almost $300 million for relief efforts, but that is just the tip of the iceberg. We've been working with the government of Japan, the U.S.-Japan Council, and the private sector to empower Japan's young leaders and entrepreneurs to participate in the reconstruction. This November, Secretary Clinton will chair the high-level dialogue at APEC to promote public and private partnerships as a way to build resilience in our business communities. These efforts stem from our unwavering commitment to the Japanese people and our in faith in their ability to rebound. We're thinking creatively about how to overcome similar experiences in the future. Japan's experience should be a lesson to all of us. And this task force has helped transform those lessons into real action plans. We do not want just to put things back the way they were. We want to rebuild for the future and for the next generation. There's much more we can do to help those affected in 311. The United States is ready to support Japan however we can by promoting the public-private cooperation, by supporting Japan's long-term economic renewal, and by continuing to strengthen the connections between our societies at every level. And even in the most tragic crises, there are opportunities for renewal and growth. And our nations are up to the challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you for what you've done. Uh, thank all of you very much. Uh, Secretary Nides, thank you. Thank you for your leadership at the department on this. Thank all of you for coming. We hope you find the report useful. As you read it and go through it, um, keep in mind this is um, the beginning of, uh, not the end of this process for us. We want to keep working in these areas, and we hope you'll be able to join with us. Thank you all very much.